Hi, I'm Maureen Cole, the town historian for Lewisboro, and today we're going to talk about some of the secrets that uh, I have found in the files of the town historian's office. So, maybe before we start, here's a little commercial. Uh, some of these stories that I'm going to talk about today can be found in a couple of the history books. We have the, his the big blue telephone book, History of uh, the Town of Lewisboro. I call it a telephone book because it's about as big as the old telephone books used to be. And then we have Remembering Lewisboro, a collection of my columns. And then the bestseller, Lewisboro Ghosts. Uh, I don't think we're going to be talking about any of the ghosts in this book today, but we will be talking about another little ghost who recently came to mind. So, I think we'll start off by uh, just, just a little background. Every town has its secrets. Some are well guarded, some are very well known, and then, as I said, some are buried in the files of the town historian's office. We're going to start today with a mystery. Most of these secrets involve a mystery. And we're going to go back to revolutionary times and Sergeant Jeremiah Keeler. Sergeant Jeremiah Keeler fought in the Revolutionary War and he was uh, present at the Battle of Yorktown at the very end of the war and because he was so esteemed by uh, Lafayette he was given a sword, and this is the sword that came to the library in the 1970s, and uh, it was buried away in a closet. When the library did its re, um, revamping in about three or four years ago, the sword was found in the closet and hadn't been seen for those 30 years or more with a letter saying it was the sword that Jeremiah Keeler walked home with when he walked home from Virginia to South Salem. The mystery about this sword is that it does not look like a picture. All right, here's the sword as we see it. It's in a scabbard, which I can't get off right now, but the sword, when you look at it closely, looks like it may have been cut off, rounded a little bit at the tip. At this point, it certainly wouldn't harm anybody unless you hit them on the head with it. It does have a groove in it, which might be for bloodletting. But also in my collection of photographs, we have this photograph of the Keeler sword. And also this is a photograph in the collection of Keeler objects over at Keeler Tavern. When you look at this sword, notice how wide the blade is. The handle is a little bit different. This is a much different sword. So there's one of the mysteries of Lewisboro, and the secret is yet to be, the mystery and the secret is yet to be solved. Where did this sword come from? Why is it known as the Jeremiah Keeler sword? Uh, at least by the family, the members of the Keeler family in Florida who sent it back to be with its hometown. Anyway, that's our first, that's our first secret. All right, now that was the revolutionary times. We're going to come forward about a hundred years and we're going to talk just a little bit about a very secretive woman. Her name was Rachel Grummond and she was the daughter of one of South Salem's famous shoemakers. South Salem was quite well known for its shoemaking industry and one of the main shoemakers was Samuel Grummond. He lived on um, what's now a, uh, Holly Mountain Road. He lived right on the corner. If you go out of town heading north toward the Three Lakes area on Oscalita Road, you pass all the Three Lakes area and you come to almost a 90 degree turn in the road to head up toward, west, uh, toward Mountain Lakes Camp. As you make that, that right angled turn, on your left is a ruin, and that is the ruin of the home of Rachel Grummond. Rachel Grummond was a recluse, apparently, a woman who kind of reminds people 
when you hear her story, the story of Great Expectations by, by Charles Dickens. Apparently, Miss Grumman was stood up at the altar, and she locked herself away in the family house and with her wedding, with her wedding dress, apparently, and whatever went with that, and really never ventured too far out. It is said she never even saw, and now she was living in the, the 1860s to the 18, well, probably born between 1860 and 1880, and did live long enough to be able to travel in a car. But during that time, as I said, she didn't really venture too far from her home. What uh, she, when she finally did venture out of her home, it was basically when uh, a neighbor took her to the hospital just before she died. And it was on that trip to the hospital that she had her first vision, saw for the first time a train. And it was most likely her first car ride too. Unfortunately, it was the last car ride of her life because that's all we know about Miss Rachel Dun Drummond, uh, Grummond, excuse me. But now, if you go very slowly up toward Holly Mountain Road, on your left, as you make that right hand turn to go up the mountain road, especially in the winter or the fall, you will see what looks like a pile of rocks. It really is a foundation, and it's the foundation of the Grumman House. So we'll go from there. That was, say, the, the end of the 19th century. We're going to segue a little bit into the 20th century and the time of the Russian Revolution, which was exactly 100 years ago, actually. And here we come to another fairly well-known secret, but still a mystery. And it is the secret that involves Alexander Kerensky. Alexander Kerensky was a quite a well-known figure and an important figure in the Russian, uh, in Russian history and especially in the, in the Russian Revolution. He was a lawyer uh, in Russia, actually born, interestingly enough, coincidentally, in the same hometown as Lenin. And uh, they, they became uh, adversaries in 1917. Andrew Kerensky, he belonged to this, the Soviet revolutionaries, the ones that actually overthrew Tsar Nicholas II. And um, his, his group came into power. And, and, uh, Alexander was named the first prime minister of the, Russian, the new Russian Republic. He foresaw great things for Russia. He, um, he uh, disestablished the death penalty. He believed in freedom of speech and in freedom of religion. And for about eight or nine months, he actually was the ruler of, of Russia until the Bolsheviks and Lenin came into power and overthrew Alexander Kerensky and his, and his group. Uh, okay, that's the Russian part of the story. Because of the defeat of his uh, supporters in Russia, and he was very popular in Russia. It's just that uh, he wasn't as, as a strong a leader as Russia needed at the time. So he was forced to, to leave Russia. He ended up in Paris. And from Paris, he stayed in Paris a few years. And from Paris, he emigrated to the United States. He kind of, when he became, when he came to the United States, he seemed to come under the support, or we had the support of the group of white Russians that were living in the States, in New York City. He stayed uh, with the kindness of strangers uh, in several, uh, he was supported by these several families in New York City. Also in New Canaan, there was a section of New Canaan, uh, a Russian section, and with these people he became, these people he became acquainted. Through the people, as near as I can figure, in New Canaan, he wanted a house of his own. He didn't want to continue staying with other people and imposing upon them. So he found a house in Vista. The house is on East Street, and it's known today as Hideout Hill. It's several miles down East Street, off of uh, 123. Uh, and it's, uh, it, it's still called Hideout Hill. 
whether it was called Hideout Hill because Alexander Kerensky was living there and people just called it his hideout. I don't know. He really did not keep a close profile while he was there. I mean, uh, a secret profile, because he did travel around the country trying to drum up support for the uh, anti-Bolsheviks in, in, in Russia. And so he did spend a good part of the time while he was living, while his home was in Vista, traveling around the country, going out to the West and even out to California. But I would say, as near as we can figure, he lived at Hideout Hill from 1941 uh, until about 1943. Old neighbors do remember him. Uh, he in, he uh, entertained a lot. Uh, he had tea parties. He had uh, he kind of treated it like a Russian dacha, a summer house, and. Uh, I was known to have tea parties in the afternoon and they would play croquet. It was quite a jolly place, so it wasn't exactly a secret hideout for him. Um, he left Vista about 1943 and probably, we really don't know, or I don't have any, any uh, uh, idea of exactly where he went, although he was out at the Hoover Institute in California for several, for several years. He died in New York City in 1970, but um, while he was here in, in Vista, he was, uh, as I say, well known to his neighbors as the very kindly white-haired gent who didn't drive a car, but people would take, pick him up and take him where he had to go if they found him walking along, along East Street. Uh, so it is really hard to imagine that somebody as important as Alexander Kerensky hung out in the hills of Vista for two or three years of his life and very important years of his life. Uh, from Alexander, we're going to stay in the kind of foreign uh, uh, intrigue business for a bit and come Almost, well, about the same time, from the 1940s into the 1950s, the hamlet of Lewisboro was home to Martha and Alfred uh, Stern. Martha, maiden name was Martha Dodd. She was um, the daughter of William, William Charles Dodd, I believe it was, who was Roosevelt's ambassador to Germany in the 1930s as, as uh, Hitler was rising into power. And um, Mr. Mr. Dodd was the ambassador to Germany and had his daughter Martha along, along with him as well as his wife and his, his, the rest of his family. Martha became enamored of the Russians that she met in Berlin uh, and even had several affairs with them. Anyway, she became very, um, very enamored of the Russian intrigue. And when, when uh, Martha's father was recalled to Washington, she also came back and eventually married Alfred Stern uh, from Chicago, a fairly wealthy, wealthy man. Martha and Alfred, some re well, Martha really fashioned herself a spy. And she engaged herself, she tried to engage herself with the Soviets as a Russian spy. And she and Alfred got involved while they were living here. Uh, apparently they owned their house on um, Kitchewan Road from about 1940 until 1954 when they mis mysteriously disappeared. But we'll go back, just go back to the beginning of the time when they, they were here, uh, they became involved with a gentleman named Boris Moros, M-O-R-R-O-S. Boris Moros was a Russian, he was um, a Russian national. He was a spy for the Soviets, but he also, uh, in, in, from about 19, in, from the 1930s until the 1940s, in about 1947, he was recruited by the FBI as a counter spy. So uh, if you have a little time, you should uh, Google Boris Moros. But anyway, 
Boris Moros got Alfred Stern to front a music company for laundering whatever money was involved with the, the espionage. Uh, one of, one of, actually, one of the songs that Boris and Alfred uh, produced, or uh, the company produced, was the Chattanooga Choo Choo. And apparently the Chattanooga Choo Choo led to a dispute between the Stearns and Boris Maros, and eventually Boris Maros outed the Stearns to the McCarthy Committee, the, uh, the House Committee on Un-American Activities. So they were indicted as spies, and as such, uh, were uh, going to be investigated when they decided it was a little bit better to leave the country. And so uh, they decided to try Mexico for a while. But to bring this even closer, uh, more into the Lewisboro uh, uh, era, era, area, uh, the, their, their property was rather large, and Elisha Keeler of Happy Home Flowers here in downtown South Salem did their lawn work. And uh, he, was, he was contacted by the FBI to keep his eye out for any purported Soviet spies that might come to the Stearns property while he was around. And if he did see any of these people, he was to contact the FBI. He was sent mugshots of several of these spies that they, the FBI thought might be visiting the Stearns house, one of them being Gus Hall, who was the Secretary General of the American Communist Party. Elisha never did see any of these people. But in my files, I have this postcard well, this is a facsimile of the postcard. It's not really this big. But um, this was sent to Lysha by Martha Dodd Stern during one of their trips to Puerto Rico in the 1950s. As I said, they, were, they knew they were under surveillance, so they did spend a lot of time back and forth in and out of the country. But I thought I'd just read what the postcard says. Dear Elisha, we had a nice vacation and we'll be back soon. Now this is from San Juan, Puerto Rico. Hope you can give us two days a week when we get back, okay? Uh, I hear Bob, and Bob was their son, kidded you on our cocktail date. It was fun and we'll have to do it again. It's very good that everybody gets, to, gets a little fun now and then. Uh, how's the work going on? Kindless regards and see you soon. Uh, take care, Mrs. Martha Stern. And um, as I say, this was while Lysha was supposedly on the lookout for any, any spies that might happen. When Martha and Alfred left South Salem, rather in the undercover of night, about 1954, they went to Mexico, and then they went to Prague, and that's where they ended their lives, unfortunately, uh, because they never did come back to the United States. They applied for, uh, uh, they were kind of indicted in absentia, but then uh, about several, well, decades later, uh, they asked, I guess it was to Lyndon Johnson when he was president, they wrote asking if they could be pardoned and their letter was ignored. Whether it was forgotten or ignored, nobody knows, but they never decided they never could come back to the country. And so uh, Alfred died in Prague in 1988, and Martha died in Prague in 1990. So uh, and as far as I know, Googling them, their son, I think, still lives in Prague, but he would be a rather old man by now. All right, we're going to uh, about that same time, and I'm not even sure what this secret uh, has to do with anything, except that in my files I found a letter from Counterattack, which was apparently an organization that helped uh, uh, the House on Un-American Activities. Uh, this this magazine would send them lists of people they thought might be good in, to be in, uh, interviewed by the committee. And one of these people 
was Harrison Foreman. Harrison Foreman was a photographer for National Geographic and, and other publications. He also was an expert on China. He had interviewed Chiang Kai-shek and Mao Zedong, uh, and he kind of was a, uh, a Chinophile, if you want to call him that. Uh, he spent a lot of time in China and in Tibet as, as a photographer and as a writer and as a journalist. Well, in my files was this letter from the counterattack organization saying, um, and I'm not sure who it was addressed to, but saying, um, we need some more information on Harrison Foreman, and we think he might be living in Lewisboro. And he was at one point. He was living in Truesdale, and the only uh, reason... I can say that is because of a dog license that was issued to his son, John, uh, back in the late 50s. And because his son was underage, his father had to sign for the dog license, and it is signed Harrison Foreman. We know John Foreman did graduate from John Jay High School, and he probably would have graduated in the early 1960s. Uh, he became famous as... Um, uh, a designer and a real estate agent in New York City, especially interested in mansions. Uh, so I'm not quite sure why they're in my files, but that is a secret to me. Uh, and I couldn't find any place else where Harrison Foreman actually was interviewed by the Committee on American Activities, but um, somebody wanted to find him. And the next, I think I will... We're going to go forward now a few years. We're going to come to 1982, and this is the secret that's not so secret, except the secret of where Kathleen Durst's body has disappeared to will probably never be solved, uh, even though since 1982, when Kathleen uh, disappeared from her Truesdale Lake home uh, and was never seen again, the, gov the, uh, the authorities have been after her husband, Robert Durst, for all these years. And in fact, as we sit here in my living room, he is on trial in California for uh, the murder of Susan Berman, who also figured into Kathleen Durst's disappearance. For those of you who don't know, uh, Robert Durst was the scion, or is the scion, he's still alive, of a very wealthy New York City uh, uh, real estate family. Very, very wealthy. Robert was kind of the, uh, the oddball of the family. His brother now runs the company, uh, and Robert is an outlier. Uh, Robert and Kathleen lived in, on a country lane in uh, uh, Lake Truesdale in the 19, 1980s. Uh, they were both kind of hippies, but she decided that she wanted something better than to just be a, a, a trophy wife. And she was going to medical school at Alfred Einstein in the city. And on a very cold night in January of 1982, Robert supposedly put Kathleen into the car, took her, well, took Kathleen to the Katona Railroad Station for her to return to New York City, where they did have an apartment, so that she could return to her classes at... Um, at Albert Einstein. Well, she never showed up at Albert Einstein. She's never really showed, as far as anybody could ascertain, did she ever really make it to her apartment? Did she ever make it on the train into New York City? Because she was never seen again. Uh, the state police, the local police, the state police have been looking for her body ever since. They've, they've combed the apartment, they've combed the house in Truesdale. They, have, they haven't dredged the lake, but they've searched the lake. Um, but there's, there's not ever been a sign of Kathleen's body, even though uh, the case has been reopened two or three times. But let's just concentrate. Well, Kathleen, unfortunately, is among the missing, but Robert never was among the missing. Uh, Soon the house, the house was sold, and uh, he ended up several decades later in Galveston, Texas. 
and he ended up there dressed as a mute woman, an older woman, mute, couldn't speak, rented a house, uh, rented an apartment rather, in a house, and ended up killing his neighbor in that apartment and quartered the body through the, through the parts into Galveston Bay. And the, the uh, police did cover the body, found uh, enough evidence to point to Robert Durst as the killer. And Robert Durst was tried by a Texas jury and got off because he, in his claim for self-defense, that he murdered his Mr. Black, his next door neighbor. Uh, how anybody can get away with quartering a body and severing the head and be uh, exonerated because it was self-defense, nobody really has figured that one out. Only Texas knows. Well, a few more years passed, and the, as I say, they never stopped searching into Robert Durst's background. Uh, and now comes the death of Susan Berman, who was a, a very good friend of Robert Durst, and according to authorities from uh, evidence that they've collected, they thought that Susan Berman was very important in the disappearance of Kathleen Durst. They think that perhaps Susan Berman impersonated Kathleen Durst, uh, calling the, uh, the dean at Albert Einstein to say that she was ill and wouldn't be in that day. Uh, but anyway, Kath, uh, Susan <clears throat> Berman, who lived out in California, showed up dead one day with a bullet in the back of her head. And within the last several years, they have accused Robert Durst of that, of that murder. And he has been extradited to California, where you can see his, his face in the New York Times every few weeks as that trial goes on. So as far as the South Salem part of that mystery, we don't know. Is Kathleen in Lake Truesdale? Is Kathleen in the Cross River Reservoir? Is Kathleen somewhere else that we'll never, we will never know? Uh, now we're going to take a little, we have just a couple of more secrets that we're going to talk about today. And for one, we're going to go back to the story of George Avery, who was a shopkeeper who lived in uh, Cross River. And uh, for some reason, he decided to abandon his shop. And it fell into rack and to ruin. Some say, well, he just decided, was it because he didn't like Abraham Lincoln and what Abraham Lincoln was standing for, that he decided to just totally abandon his dry goods store and let it fall apart? Uh, was it because his wife had died and he was very, very sad? For whatever reason, George Avery's shop stood on, on uh, the side of Route 35, somewhere in the vicinity of where the 5th Division Market is today. And uh, people who, uh, even into the 1930s or early 40s, the shop was still standing as a ruin there. And uh, old timers talked about going into the basement and seeing all the crinolines and the hoop skirts and uh, the leftovers of his general store. The mystery is, and the secret, George Avery kept to his grave because nobody knows why he just abandoned his shop in Cross River. And you can see from the picture that uh, the shop was, only, was just sinking into the ground. This is a ghost story, and it's a ghost story that came to me about two years ago by a woman I'm going to call J.M. because we really don't want uh, too much known about where this took place, but it ended in the Cross River Cemetery and anybody can go there and see the grave of the little girl that I'm going to talk about. Um, this is the story of little Carrie, a.k.a. Sarah. Um, J.M., who came to me looking for help, looking for a way of trying to identify a spirit that was visiting her uh, on her job. The spirit would come at night. It was the spirit of a little girl, maybe three or four years old, dressed in uh, 
the garb of the 1860s, Civil War time, uh, dressed in a long, a long, probably a nightgown. And she came to JM seeking help. She said, I'm Sarah. I'm not little Carrie. I'm not buried in that grave that says little Carrie. And she was so, uh, so sad, but so adamant about not being the person or the name on the gravestone that was in the cemetery uh, that caused JM to wonder just who this person was. Uh, no, no information at all. And, but she figured, well, since I do uh, work here in Cross River, maybe I'll try going to the Cross River Cemetery. And she went into the cemetery uh, and she was led by the spirit to the grave that, is, that says uh, Little Carrie on it. Now, <clears throat> I do have uh, between J.M. and me, we figured out who Little Carrie was and we did gravestone rubbings. Here is not a very good one, but I will read what this grave says. This is really half the gravestone. It says, Little Carrie, and you can kind of see an M if you look very closely. Killed, now that's where this starts. Killed at Cars Rock in the New York Erie Railroad disaster, April 15th, 16, 1868. Uh, so you go from there. First of all, it's rather startling to see the word killed on a gravestone. Usually it says died, departed, but not killed. And when you see killed, you wonder why was that, why was that on the gravestone? Uh, well, did a little more searching and, uh, Car, there was a terrible railroad accident at Cars Rock, which is the new name for Shahola, Pennsylvania, which is in Pikes County. Uh, this railroad disaster was on the Pennsylvania side of the Delaware River, right near Port Jervis. Uh, Port Jervis is the New York side of the river. And about 3 o'clock on the night or the early morning of April 15th, because of somebody who had jeopard who had... Uh, uh, done something to the railroad tracks. A, uh, a tra the train coming from Buffalo through Elmira to New York had derailed. It had about seven cars on it. And unfortunately, three of the cars went off the track, <clears throat> tumbled down the hill toward the Delaware, and uh, 24 people were killed outright. Many were, were burned beyond recognition. Uh, and what the cars that went off the track, unfortunately, were the sleeping cars. And in each of the sleeping cars, there was a pot-bellied stove. Of course, tumbling down the river, stoves uh, caught the, uh, the, the fire from the stoves, caught the, end, caught the cars on fire. And as I said, that night, 24 people were killed. Uh, another 60 to 70 were injured, and some of the injured died later. One of the person, persons killed was the daughter, the three, three or four-year-old daughter of Eliza Tisdale of Elmira, New York. Now, uh, this, this brings the reason why this child was buried in Cross River Cemetery. Looking up the name Tisdale, we find that even though she lived in Elmira, uh, she was she was from C Cross River. She was Eliza Monroe from Cross River, and she married Bethuel uh, Tisdale of Elmira. And uh, the reason we found that part out, I have to go back a little ways. Um, J. M. and I went to the cemetery. We took pictures. We did rubbings, and we scoured the front of the stone of Little Carrie. I told the story to a friend of mine who loved to uh, visit 
cemeteries. So she and her husband went there uh, after they heard the story from me. And they didn't look at only the front. They went around and looked at the back of the stone. And on the back of the stone uh, was another, well, we did another. This rubbing is not that good. But it says, only child of Bethuel and Eliza Tisdale died uh, at the age of four years. I think it's two months and maybe 10 days. So the back of the story gave us some names so that I could continue. And that's how I discovered that uh, the mother of this child was from Cross River and she was buried in the grandparents' plot, the Monroe plot in the Cross River Cemetery. Um, but to continue a little bit with Car Carrie's and Sarah's story, uh, as I say, this spirit that kept appearing to J.M. said, I'm not little Carrie. I'm not little Carrie. Uh, I'm Sarah, and you have to do something for the orphans of war. The orphans of war are very important. You have to do something for the orphans of war. Well, um, now it, the story kind of diverges. Uh, she, Sarah, the spirit Sarah, said that she is claiming herself as an orphan of war and that she was sent back from uh, the South, from the war zone, to her grandmother in New York State. But then her grandmother didn't want her anymore and was sending her back. Where she was sending her back, we don't know. So if the person in the grave is not little Carrie Tisdale, but because of the burning of the bodies and so much confusion at the scene of the crash, perhaps the bodies were switched. And it really is Sarah who's in this grave and little Carrie is perhaps in Sarah's grave. Uh, no end to this story. There probably never will be an end to this story. Uh, and I'm not going to say one or the other, although I did uh, do a little bit of research. And in Elmira, where the train stopped, one of the last stops before the tragic accident, uh, in Elmira, there was a very large orphanage that had just been started about a year ago for orphans of the Civil War. So perhaps this, uh, this Sarah had been at that orphanage and had been sent home, happened to be traveling on the train to go back to her father or her mother, wherever she'd come from and uh, that she didn't get on with her mother uh, in Ithaca, where the parents, where the Tisdales lived, but got on in Elmira, where the orphanage was. The two stories are buried somewhere, I think, on the banks of the Delaware River, and we will never know the ending to that. And my last, we've reached the last one, and we're over in Golden's Bridge, and this I mentioned this several times when I, when I meet people from Golden's Bridge for the first time, and they say they've never heard of this. Uh, but I call it the balanced rock of Golden's Bridge. Not as big and as exciting as the balanced rock that is up in North Salem, but there it is in the woods of Golden's Bridge behind the, shop, the Golden's Bridge Shopping Center. Uh, I wish it was shown to me by John Lally, who grew up in Golden's Bridge, worked for the railroad, and uh, lived on old Bedford Road. The Lally family had been there for a long time. Anyway, John was showing me uh, about 25 years ago, or about that long ago, I guess, when I was working on my Images of Lewis Bro book. So that was probably about 20 years ago. He said, I've got to show you this balanced rock. And so we climbed up into the woods behind the shopping center, and there, lo and behold, was a balanced rock. So we're going to leave you there. And uh, uh, if you want to know where the secret balanced rock is, you'll have to come find me, and maybe I'll take you on a hike, and we'll discover it again together. This is Maureen Cole, town historian for Lewisboro, saying come visit with us again and learn more of the town's secrets.
You're watching Lewisboro Community Television, Channel 20.